something totally different. Okay, epicenter. Well, we know that the epicenter is a constant. It was a very extended fault. Okay, now we know. This was the foreshock, magnitude 9. Now we know what is a magnitude. Okay, it's related to moment. And here we have the we see the locations of two pressure meters of a seabot. And here you see the earthquake. Okay, it's very nice. But then we see something, a perturbation of the sea bottom that is totally different. That's pressure of the water height column that is on the top. So something is increasing here, but please give a look to the time. Because it's taking a long time. These are 20 minutes. Now in 20 minutes, <coughs> as we know, seismic waves passed from half part of the, of the Earth. Again, what is this? Okay, that's the signal related to the perturbation of the column of water on top of these two instruments due to something that is a, a wave. But it's a wave that is very different from the seismic waves that we have been discussing since the wave physics course. What do we see here? Well, they have long period, if you give a look to this. It's very long. They are, well, let's see, tiny amplitude, hmm. maybe yes, also if it's meters. Is it tiny amplitude? Yes, if we compare it with the water height. So that's an oceanic uh, region, so maybe we have four kilometers of water. So some meters over four kilometers is tiny amplitude. Long period. And they are slow. Well, are they slow? Uh, yes, compared to the seismic waves, because they come later. These are gravity waves, because actually we have to change our uh, point of view. We had always been discussing, except for sounding water in, in wave physics, something that is related to elasticity, Hooke's law. So Hooke's law is the one responsible for this, this, P waves, S waves, Rayleigh waves, love waves. Okay, we know. Now, what about liquids? Well, we have sounding water, compression and refraction. But the main restoring force for liquids, not for gases, not for solids, maybe it's gravity. Because it's gravity that is trying to put, again, the surface, when you throw a stone in a pond, for example, we are perturbing the equilibrium, that is a free surface on a gravity field, so it's trying to go back. What about solids? Well, we neglected gravity because we have been lazy. We said, okay, let's imagine that this table is in equilibrium under a gravity field. Okay, let's start from here. Let's study elastic waves. That's why we always deleted the body force term in the equations of elastic motion. Well, at a given time, we have been deciding, no, 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 let's use the body forces, but not for gravity, but to represent the source. But no gravity in seismic waves. Let me tell you that they could be important if you consider long period spheroidal modes. Because if you do remember mm -hmm. torsional and spheroidal modes, those are the three modes of the Earth related to radiant. Now, torsional modes, they don't change volume because they are pure shear waves, okay? But actually, Rayleigh waves have a part of P, so they are changing volume, okay, as a transient. So actually, gravity can act when you change volume because density is locally changing. So they could be important at long period of spheroidal modes, but okay. But for liquids, they are important. They are so important that usually in fluid dynamics, you consider an, an incompressible fluid. What does it mean? OK, let's imagine that what we call the bulk modulus, that is responsible for propagation of sound waves, is infinite. Is it? No, it's not. But let's assume that it is so that all the fast sound waves are so fast that they are out of the game. 
And so you can focus on other slower phenomena, like gravity waves. So just in, in short terms, in, in few words, tsunami waves are gravity waves, like the wind waves, but they are very long period, very long wavelength, and tiny amplitude. We will go back to, to this definition later. Uh, let me tell you that I, just to be shorter in, in time, some of the slides that are online, I, I neglect. During this lecture, I, I will skip it, okay? So it's a little bit shorter than the one that you have been printing. But the main message here is, okay, now, the liquid there is not only containing sound, Rayleigh, seismic waves, these ones, but there is also an additional perturbation, tsunami waves. Okay, just to tell you that the instruments that are used to detect tsunami or also some, some tight perturbations, nowadays in modern days they are called dark buoys and usually they appear connected with the buoy that is floating, okay, so it's a sort of internal, like a GPS, but uh, actually some of them are containing a GPS so that they can communicate with, with satellites. What is important is that they usually con uh, are also connected with something that can measure on the bottom the transient connected to pressure. What does it mean that if you remember the I'm sure that you don't remember, but in wave physics, we consider a liquid layer over a hard space as the simplest example of Rayleigh waves. And we know that at that interface, we can use boundary conditions, what vertical component of displacement is continuous. The vertical component of stress is continuous. Here it is pressure, here it is sigma z, z, z. The um, tangential component of stress in liquid, because it is pretty much an ideal liquid, is zero. So here we have the free surface for shear. Horizontal component of motion, if you don't consider viscosity, is free. Now with those boundary conditions, we understood that Rayleigh waves are coupling P and SV waves down and P waves up. So actually, that's why here you can record an earthquake in terms of seismic waves. Because you have pressure and displacement there. You have P waves here. Here you have P, SV, you have everything. But, of course, if you're changing the water column for gravity waves, a pressure meter there is measuring that perturbation. Okay, so that buoys, a different point of view. This is not pretty much sensitive to seismic waves, but this, yes, okay? What's next? This is, in, in a, how to say that, larger detail, the wave train recorded here after the Toku event, in Kamaish, that is one of the locations that has been pretty much wiped out by the tsunami. Now let's give a look to it. Uh, this slide is here just to, to let you to, to have an idea how different a tsunami gram, it's not a seismogram, it's not a velocigram, it's not an accelerogram, is different than the seismic waveforms. Because please give a look to the time scale here. It's in hours. Okay, so it's totally different. It's slower and longer period. Okay, and you see here that there is a small retreat, and this is quite common for specific mechanisms, and then a huge positive value here. And you see that the period of these oscillations is very long. Okay, what can this attack? That's why I was putting here. That's another vision, in better detail of that part. You see how long period it is. Here it is 10 minutes. So it's very slow. For seismic wave, it's a long time. But for a gravity wave, you see that's the nature of time. So 10 minutes here, 10 minutes here, and so on. 
very long period. And you could say, well, the height is impressive because it's in meters. But please remember that you have to compare it with the system. And the system is, in many cases, an oceanic layer. So that's why usually you, you notice tsunamis only when they arrive, when, when they approach the shoreline. But in open ocean, it's not easy to see them. Because maybe they are one, two meters. So it's not that much. What is much is the wavelength. Because they can be 100 kilometers long. So you have to imagine that the amplitude is tiny, but the motion, the energetic motion of water is huge. Because you have a very long wavelength. Okay, uh, well, this is just a model of Kenji's attack. Let me skip this part. Now, just to start from the experience of Toku, and we will finish with the experience of Toku, but just to show to you a, a few, just a few data that have been collected the days after March 11. And they're impressive because they collected this. Well, you see, that's, that was just a couple of days. And this is this part of the Japanese coast with the signature left there in terms of tsunami height, but now at the coast. And it reached, in some places, 20 meters. So I told you, please remember this, one, two meters, that's, that's a huge amplitude also if tiny compared to four kilometers. But when they approach the shoreline, you will see a, an animation later, actually, Okay, let me spoiler one slide. Here. If you want to remember one velocity for gravity waves, as you know, it's this. It's not an accurate description. I put some theoretical slides later. But if you want to take a first approximation, you can say, okay, tsunami waves are tiny amplitudes, long period, long wavelets, shallow water waves. Shallow water. Hmm. We will see. So in this case, this is the relation that is connecting velocity, the height of the water column, and gravity, because these are gravity waves. Now this expression is valid for any shallow water wave. Those will be wind waves. And in open ocean, this is for Okay, let's say, let's put four kilometers. Water. This is 0 0.2 kilometers per second. Now you could say, wow, it's fast. Yeah, it's fast. It's like an airplane, but it's much slower than seismic waves. It's much slower than sound waves. Sound waves in water is 1.5 kilometers per second. Seismic waves could be S waves, let's say, 4 kilometers per second. P waves could be 10 kilometers per second. So it's slow. Um, another important definition here is that when you run some literature about tsunami height, you have to take care about the definition of tsunami height that usually is defined here. Still, when the tsunami gravity wave is linear. Linear in the sense that it is a transit with all the characteristics of waves. You have to imagine that then later approaching the shoreline, that height is getting smaller, 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 smaller. So it's getting slower, so also the wave train. And this means that you're you're squeezing the energy in, in a smaller wavelength and so height is increasing. It's so increasing that then the tsunami height is larger than maybe the water column. So it's penetrating inland. So when you measure the maximum height at the maximum penetration depth, that's called tsunami ramp. It's not tsunami height. In most of the slides that we're going to discuss today here, it will be tsunami height. But when you go on the shoreline and you try to measure what is the maximum penetration depth and the maximum height at the penetration depth, it's called tsunami run. It's a non-linear phenomenon because it's the ingression of a wave, wave is broken and it's penetrating inland. Okay, so it's non linear. And it's called run. Okay, what's next? 
again some other impressive numbers about the Toku event. Because, for example, here, this is the northern Saint Riku zone, this is the southern one, but you can huh, tragically admire the numbers here. And if you give a look to, to this, the, the red dots are the March 2011 event, and in some places it, it was huge. Wow. So huge that it was, it was not exactly expected. And this will be the final part of this short presentation about tsunami. Um, so you could say, but is it the first time that an event like that occurred? Well, maybe not, because actually in some parts of the coast, the the Japanese underrated this, this information. For example, in 1933 and in 1896, it was called the Meiji event and the Showa event. Well, some other quite impressive heights have been reached. But you can understand that this hardly can be considered an instrumental period for tsunamis here. So it was written somewhere, written on stones. So it was not so, how to say, easily remembered, this piece of information. By the way, message here is, OK, 20 meters on average from that part. It's huge. 20 meters, it's huge, especially if you consider the wavelength. So it's not a wind-driven wave, and the wavelength is, let's say, 10 meters. It could be kilometers. So that's why the, the energy is a lot. OK. Now, let's try to using, let's try to use this data here, and maybe we can do something. Yes, we can do something, because tsunami physics uh, but usually is approached according to, to two different views. One is the numerical approach, and usually it's coming from fluid dynamics approach. It's called the bien-coupled modeling of tsunami waves. And the other one is actually is called the coupled, usually analytical approach. But OK, the message, as yesterday, Roberto Paolucci was mentioning physics-based hazard, if you remember, that means modeling. Okay with the tools that we discussed in this course. So what about tsunami modeling? OK, it can be done. So what we can do is try to use our theory, yes, representation theorem, extended folds, the Green's function, blah, blah. Now the Green's function is not the seismic one. It's the fluid dynamic one. It's gravity. So let's try to use that data, those data. Let's try to do some modeling, and let's try to see Let's try to match that. So we can have a picture of a source, not using seismic waves, not using GPS, as we have done before, the rupture, but using tsunami. Please do remember that tsunami usually has very long periods. And wavelength is quite large. What does it mean? But the information that you will get about the source will not be very accurate, like using acceleration that has short wavelengths. So your vision will be a global vision of the source, but it's very useful because long period can help us to measure moment. If you do remember, remember that I will ask you at the exam, your not the last, but the last minus one homework, the reading of uh, Stein and Oker. Long period information is very important for mega earthquakes to really assess moment. And you can use, yes, the three modes of the Earth, like they did. You can use GPS, but you can use also tsunami, because it's very long period. OK, just to tell you that Kenji Satake, just a few days, actually maybe the same day, of the event, tried to do some simulations. This was one of the first. And what he did later was to use this simulation trying to do a forward modeling at some sites where he was collecting the data. And this is one of the first attempts. So he had been using. Now you, you, you can appreciate how big is the tsunami source there, that is the earthquake source as well. 
So simulation, numerical values, physics-based, if you want, you can call it also like that, trying to compare with available data. Now, just few data there, because the, most of the uh, say instruments there have been wiped out. But, okay, part of the modeling, later we did the additional one. Look at this, nice, this is Kamaishi, that's the modeling Kamaishi. Please appreciate how the signal is quite a periodic, quite, pretty much an harmonic wave. But please give a look to the amplitude. Yes, it's 20 meters. Yep. It's, okay, nothing compared to, to, to 4 kilometers, maybe. But it's huge. It's going to approach the coast, as you can imagine. It's 20. 20 with a period that is, wow, it's long. Look, to do one cycle here, like, let's take like that, is 30 minutes. So it's long. You do understand how long period is this signal. Okay, so he did this, he was performing this simulation. Later he did additional ones, comparing with more data that had been collected later. And what he was using was physics-based modeling. Not exactly to predict the hazard, because he was modeling an event that occurred there with the information that he had about the location of the fault, etc. Try to model the arrival times and the heights in some part of the coast, trying to get a vision of the source as seen from the tsunami wave field point of view. And this is what he collected, for example. Now, this is the source that can correspond to a moment 9. There is the slip on the source as felt by tsunamis. Now, please give a look to the dimension of the pixels here. It's not tiny as the one, as the picture that we can get from seismic waves, from velocities, acceleration. Okay? The pixels are broader. Why? Because wavelength is larger. Please do remember, I know it's trivial what I'm going to write now. But wavelength is velocity times speed. Now you can say, but velocity is, well, it's lower, so maybe it's tiny. But here, this one is between 100 and 1,000 seconds. So you do understand that the wavelength is, on average, of 100 kilometers. So you cannot resolve tiny details there. But you have a very important information about the gross feature of the source, as you can see here. So that's the slip on the fault as inverted from the tsunami. Now you can compare this picture with those that we had been looking at at the beginning of the course, when there was the first inversion of a source there, using teleseismic waves, USGS. I hope you do remember it's in the first lecture introduction. Uh, that was a vision about the data collected for the Toku event. And so the vision is complementary, long period vision. But it's important for moment, as you can understand, like different modes of the Earth. OK, and this is a very important animation I will show to you once, and then we will give a, a look to it again. But it's showing to you how beautiful is the tsunami wave. What you can appreciate, well, it's beautiful and, and tragic in some cases, of course. Uh, let me go back, because then you will see, now you will see, ah, I'm not able to stop here. Stop. OK, let's follow another way. OK, it should be here. Now, what I want you to Let's see if I can do that. Okay. Now look at the time now. We have been looking at the ground motion animation of the seismic waves. The time, if you remember, the rupture was lasting, let's say, two, three minutes. Wave propagation on the Japanese island, on the Japanese islands, was about six minutes. Then the seismic waves were going around the Earth, three modes, and so on. Now, give a look to the time scale here, because you will see 
that in 20, 40 minutes, waves will arrive to the shore. It's much later than the seismic waves. So tsunami waves are slow compared to those. And you will see that in some parts of the coast, uh, you, you can also imagine that another part of the signal is traveling towards open ocean. You know, we'll, and later after this slide, we will see another animation. But for the Japanese scales, you will see that in 20 minutes, the first waves were arriving at the north, as you can see, and in 40 minutes, they had been arriving in other parts of Japan. So please give a look to the time scales. Now, this is totally different than seismic, okay? Another example of physics-based, if you want, animation. But this is done, has been done not by Furumura, before it, to, to Japanese researchers. This has been made by the US agency that is responsible for uh, tsunami hazard. And but they are cooperating also with the Japanese. They are responsible for the Pacific tsunami warning system. And this is impressive and nice because you will see a totally different time scale here. Okay, let's give a look to this once. Let me go back. Now, give a look on the top left. The earthquake occurs. After some minutes, the waves, let's say after 20 minutes, as we have seen, 20, 40 minutes, part of the waves approach Japan. But the other part of the waves, they were entering into the open ocean. Those yellow squares are indicating some buoys that are on the other side. And here, what you see are, for those four squares, two signals. One is the recorded one. The other one is the predicted one. Now, in which sense predicted? Well, you have to know that NOAA has a huge set of pre-computed signals. Let's say they pre-computed green functions. Now you know it is a green function. It's the response of the system to a unitary force, and blah, 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 for many sources around, let's say, in the, in the Circum-Pacific region. When they receive the news that a large earthquake occurs, usually they consider only earthquakes with magnitude 7 and more, they get the information about the location, and you can get it thanks to seismic as you can imagine, okay? They put there an indication about magnitude. They use the pre-computed green functions. They create a source that is, how to say, a sort of a picture of what could be happening there. And they assemble the green functions with the representation theorem, if you want. And they predict. This takes, let's say, one hour, or maybe less, okay? Once they do the computation, they try to validate it. Using what? Well, the first available recorded signals. And of course, they are these ones. If the validation is OK, then they use the computed waveforms to predict and maybe to issue a warning. So validation here, let's say one, two hours. Then give a look to the time scale because the tsunami wave is very efficient. Why? Because water has a very large Q. Now you know. It's very efficient to, to, to be. You, you can speak very efficiently in water. And also gravity waves are pretty much efficient. Here, spreading is affecting the amplitude. But they are slow. So you see that here, 12, 14 hours passed after the event. So there is time for warning on this scale, circum-Pacific scale. You will see that the wave will arrive here, arrive here almost 24 hours later. So there is time to say, OK, please go away from the coast. Uh, the idea of a tsunami warning system started after the 1960 Chilean event, Valdivia event that was here. It was magnitude later it has been 
assessed with the magnitude 9.5. It's the largest magnitude event in human history as assessment for uncertainties, of course. And what was impressive for them that 24 hours later, the waves approach, killed some people at the Hawaii, and then killed tens of fishermen on the Japanese coast. And they were not ready for that. No one was imagining that one day after an event, something was arriving from the sea. So that's why after 1960, um, Japan and US decided to, to start a, tsu a tsunami warning system with this kind of modeling, with, with warnings. Uh, you can imagine that now satellite communications, blah, blah, blah. Now it could be very efficient. It could be very efficient, of course, when you have tens of hours. It's not easy to be efficient when you have 20 minutes, as the Japanese had. Okay, you, you can imagine this. Um, and it was not efficient, actually. There was no warning system at all in the Indian Ocean when the 2004 event, Sumatra event, occurred. So there was pretty much no warning there. And if you have read, if you did your homework uh, reading the um, paper by Okal, Steinem uh, Okal, you discover that the first assessment of magnitude, it was 8 or 8.8 .8 at the time. So no one, no one was waiting for such a huge tsunami later. So no warning. The magnitude, there was a warning. But there was no communication system in the Indian Ocean. In the Pacific, there was, let's say, since the 70s. But in the Indian Ocean, there was not. And the magnitude was assessed as, at largest, 8.8. .8. It's huge, but not that much. OK, so that was the, the uh, you have an evidence of hazard that can be assessed and risk that is amplified by large vulnerability. So the absence of a warning system <coughs> is exposing you. Um, the hazard, if you underestimate the magnitude, was not properly assessed. But now you understand why it was not easy, because magnitude 9.2 can be assessed only using long period information. And you have to wait for it. You have to wait the three modes. You have to wait a GPS, but in Indonesia there was, at that time, no GPS devoted to that fault. Or you have to wait tsunamis. But you have to wait. OK. So the message here is to give to you an idea about time scales, an idea about hazard and risk that we will discuss later at the end of this lecture here, this disordered lecture, very disordered. Now a few slides about tsunami physics. And we could spend a course about this. Uh, just a few years ago, Emil Oka was visiting SDP, and he's great in teaching tsunamis. I'm not, definitely not that great. So we'll give to you just a few hints about tsunami physics. But in, in practice, they are, can be considered very simple, compared, for example, for, to earthquake physics. Uh, if, if you want to be very basic, actually, for earthquake-generated tsunamis, that's important. What we are going to speak today is mainly earthquake-generated. You can imagine a slip on a fault that is very rapid for fluids, for liquids. Remember the time scales. So what you are going to do is to give potential energy to a liquid. How much? Well. Being very rough here, let's imagine that you're perturbing the, uh, the water bottom here by an amount. How much it could be the slip of a fault? Maybe it could be five meters, right? So it's, let's say nothing. Hmm. Wait, because you have five meters, and if you have a magnitude nine, for example, you can have a fault that is, let's say, 600 kilometers long. So you have five meters with the width of the fault projecting on the surface for, let's say, 600 kilometers. Now, all this energy here is transmitted pretty much in a, in a very fast way to the water. 
So actually here you have a delta H that is tiny compared to the water column, but could be very long, and you are giving so a huge amount of potential energy. Now if you give potential, let's wait for kinetic. Gravity now is acting, trying to pull down now this amount of water. So it's falling. You're converting this in gravity waves that we are going to travel. That's physics. Very basic. So this side here, just very rough computations about a sort of a energetic balance. Now, how much is the tsunami energy? Well, we know, if you go back to the earthquake size lecture, that since Gutenberg and Richter, there was a relationship between magnitude and energy that was used also for the definition of seismic moment. You know the origin of, the theoretical origin of 1.5. Well, you have this relation here. You can compute this if you have a magnitude, roughly said, and it is this for a magnitude 9. Now, what about tsunami energy? Well, let's say it's potential energy that will be transformed later into kinetic energy. So what do we have here? The potential energy is gravitational potential energy. So it's, it will be the middle part of the center of the mass, one, two. Rho g, that's Archimedes' law, if you want, or Stellinus' law. Now, what about this? Well, it's the length that is huge. The wavelength that is huge there, and also if I is tiny, that could be a large amount. So, you can put this. Let's say that this is 10 kilometers, it's the width of the fork projected there, but the length can be very long, it could be 1,000 kilometers, think also to Sumatra, event, more than 1,000 kilometers, and let's say that this is 5 meters. So it's nothing compared to 4 kilometers, but it's 5. Okay, you get this, you get a number that is two orders of magnitude less than the earthquake energy. So it's a tiny part of the energy that was accumulated by stress there. Friction, seismic energy, but if you have water on the top, then you will have a part that it's maybe 100%. Um, yes, okay. 0 0.01 the energy of the earthquake, but this is huge if you have a magnitude 9. So now you have a huge energy potential that is going to be transformed into kinetic. Kinetic, and you can draw this beautiful picture here, and very simple. And if you make a rough guess about what's going on there, you will get that. Okay, the amplitude, let's say 5 meters, is much less than the water height, could be 4 kilometers, it's much less, okay? So tiny amplitude, but the wavelength of the perturbation that you're giving there is much larger than the water height. So we have three steps of order of magnitude. Let's say 10 kilometers, 4 kilometers, 4 meters. Just to sum up that, just in a few words, if you have to take home uh, just a few words about tsunami physics, you can say that it is a tiny amplitude, large wavelength, shallow water gravity wave. Why shallow? What does it mean shallow? Well, shallow is not an absolute adjective here. It's a relative one. What is shallow water? What is shallow? Well, for me, shallow is less than two meters because I'm scared about water. Okay? Two meters. But actually, shallow, physically speaking, is decided by the ratio between the wavelength and the water height. So if you take a wind-driven wave that has a wavelength of 10 meters, 10 meters is nothing compared to 4 kilometers. So it's not shallow water. But if you take something that has 100 kilometers compared to 4, well, that's shallow water. Now, this is very rough, very basic tsunami physics. Can we do something better? Yes, but sorry for you. 
we'll spend just one slide, about half of the slide, about these Stokes equations. Do you want to model gravity waves? Well, as I told you, you have two possible approaches. One approach is to use the fluid dynamics point of view. So we take a water basin, it could be very beautifully modeled, 3D, taking care about beautiful bathymetry, and you apply the equations of motion, not of the Earth, but just those of fluids. Now fluids are ruled by Navier-Stokes equations. What do we have here? Acceleration. But please do remember, uh, you, you took a course about fluid dynamics, right? So maybe you as well? You're going to take one? No, but I can see that. Okay, but that's the only slide about fluid okay. dynamics. But Okay, um, fluid in some way are simpler. In some way, they can be more complicated for nonlinear effects. This is Newton's law, because it's roughly set. But, but in a fluid, we have to remember one thing. But fluid can move. So if, if I do this, if I don't break the table, the table will shake and we'll go back to the equilibrium. But fluid, they have acceleration related to the passage of a transient, but they can also flow. So please do remember that this term here as a derivative as two derivatives, the objective derivative and the traditional derivative. So you can have transport here. And it is embedded here. What do we have here? Oh, those are sound waves. Beautiful sound waves. We treated them. What do we have here? Well, an elasticity. Oh, we can call it viscosity. Eta is viscosity but usually is also treated with an additional term that is nonlinear. It's a mess. It's not my cup of tea. What do we have here? Oh, no, that's the gradient of a potential of a conservative force. That's correct. So if you want to study sound waves, you wipe this one, you wipe this one, you wipe this one, you wipe this one, and you take this, and you get sound wave equation, wave physics. You want to study transport, you have to take this. You have to study gravity waves, you have to take that. So now this Stokes equation. And please remember that in some cases, as you we will have discussed, if you assume that the fluid is uncompressible, what does it mean? Bulk modulus is infinite. So if I squeeze water, I cannot. What does it mean? As soon as I push water, in no time, perturbation is traveling. Okay, that's out. Saying that it is so fast, but it's out of the game. And actually, you exclude that one. So what do you care when you assume an incompressible fluid? Okay, you can study flow, or you can study, study gravity waves. If you shape these equations a little bit, you get this. But I don't want to enter into this detail. I'm just telling you that if you take your fluid dynamics equations and you focus on gravity waves, well, you get this equation. It's called a dispersion relation. Why? Oh, you should remember, since the wave physics course, that every time that we discuss a relationship between omega and k, we can have a dispersion relation. Oh, well, omega over k is, is also velocity. We can have sound waves. We can have P waves. Uh, well, we can have transverse waves in a zig. All of them. Then we discussed a long time ago plates, or lab waves, or any waves, dispersion. But in general terms, every time that you have omega and k, relation that is not a line, you have dispersion. Because that means that velocity depends upon frequency. Okay, in fluid dynamics, usually you get this. Omega is omega, k is k, and h is the thickness of the fluid. 
Now, we have two extremes. Since k is k, k is 2 pi over lambda. Now you can take two extreme cases. When h over lambda is going to 0, what does it mean? Shallow water. You're writing a lot of things here, but I guess that you've attended green dynamics, of course. So it should be trivial. Uh, OK, OK. On the other side, h is much larger than lambda. Deep water. And if you take these two extreme cases, this relationship can be simplified following two branches. Deep water. So h is larger, kh is going to infinite, and the tangent is going to simplify to 1. That, that's not tangent, it's the hyperbolic tangent. OK, good. Now, please notice, oops, sorry. Please notice that this is a nonlinear relation, because here we have omega squared. So, actually, what about phase velocity? Well, we have to take this. What about group velocity? Well, you have to take care of this. Usually, group velocity is half of phase velocity. Now, this is the rule for deep water waves. When you throw a stone, or wind is hitting the surface of a quite a thick column of water, you got deep water waves. The other extreme here is when the kh is going to zero. When kh is going to zero, that's nice because the hyperbolic tangent is kh, is the argument. And now, if you perform this, the relation for phase velocity and group velocity is the same, and it's not dispersed because we have gravity and thickness there. It's a number. So no dispersion, and actually group velocity is light phase velocity, and it is that one. And it was the one that is easy to remember. OK? This is general fluid dynamics kinematics, actually, using a least Stokes equation. This is valid for every gravity wave. Also, if you throw a stone in a pond. Now, what about tsunamis? What about Beach waves. OK, that's the answer. Now, that's the most important slide for today in the slides devoted to tsunami physics. It's quite simple. It's a cartoon. It's a picture prepared, prepared by uh, Stephen Ward. It is another tsunami expert and visited I speak uh, quite a long time ago. It was after the Sumatra. He gave many talks here, but OK. He prepared a very nice paper, but just for your completeness, I, um, if you want to go deeper with tsunami physics and theory, it is on the website that now is dead, but it will be, it's going to uh, reborn in a few days. That's why I left there the PDF of it's called Tsunami, um, Tsunami by Stephen Ward. It's coming from an encyclopedia, where you can find this picture. But what I want to discuss with you is this picture. Let's give a look to what we have here. Period. Hmm. Seconds. That's one hertz. But here we're going to the long period part. OK? And what we have here is wavelength and velocity. Let's give a look to the velocity here. Now, let's go to very long periods. At these long periods here, if you go up, the perturbations, the wavelength is so large, you see here, that the water column of an ocean is pretty much nothing. So it's shallow water. Okay, 100 or 1,000 over 
a water depth of one kilometer, two kilometers, four kilometers, okay? Those are the deepest oceans, six kilometers. It's nothing. Shallow water. Actually, here, you see that the velocity is flat. No dispersion. It's constant. How much it is? Well, for 4 kilometers, for example, it's 200 meters per second. On the other side here, throwing stones in the pond or looking at wind-driven waves at the beach, you have seconds that are about 10 seconds. You have wavelengths that also in, at their largest expression can be here, let's say, the immense oceanic waves, wind-driven, can be 100 meters. It's huge. You can be scared. But actually, 100 meters now, for a water column of 1 kilometer, 4 kilometer, is pretty much nothing. So that's deep water. And that, that's why if you go here, actually, the dispersion equation that you have to look for is the other one. And you see that Phase velocity and group velocity, now they are separated, and one is half of the other. Now, what about tsunamis? Tsunamis, mega tsunamis, earthquake induced, because a tsunami can also be driven, for example, in some cases, by huge perturbation in the atmosphere. They are called meta tsunamis. So let's imagine that you're uh, hitting the surface of the water with some perturbation coming from storms like that, okay, you're changing, you're giving potential energy. But the wavelength is much shorter than the wavelength given by a mega earthquake there. That's why for earthquake induced tsunamis, mega earthquake induced, the periods here are running from 100 to 1000. Wavelengths are between 10 and 1 kilometers. And so, most of their lives is in the shallow water domain. Then, a part of their lives is beginning to be deep water. It depends, of course, on their wavelength and the ratio with the water height. So that's why long period, large wavelength, mostly shallow water waves. You can think about this phase velocity and group velocity, as we did for love waves and Rayleigh waves, you can call them eigenvalues of a problem. What about the eigenfunctions that are describing the displacement versus depth? Okay, now that's the other side of the story. And now you can see that, for example, if you take a 50 seconds gravity wave and you go here, well, the wavelength is large, but not that large, compared to what? To water height. So if you have here a four kilometers ocean, actually, these are mostly deep water waves. And the displacement can be huge, relatively huge on the top, but it's vanishing like that. So now you can understand that this part here is not strongly excited by the bottom. The tagging function, that string of a guitar, is, can be excited from the top. But now, if you go to a longer segments, like here, longer period, now you're here, you have, let's say, a 10 kilometers, 100 kilometers wavelength, that's large with four. That's shallow water. And now the again function is large there, and it's approaching, it's not going zero, at least in the X component, in the bottom. That's why it can be excited by earthquakes. So, what I'm trying to tell to you is that tsunami physics can be studied by fluid dynamics, giving a look to the equations of motion that now are Navier Stokes studying the dispersion relation that is ruling gravity waves. The only difference is that you're looking at them at a totally different time window. The longer periods, larger wavelengths, and mostly shallow water. The same physics applying a 
applies to beach waves, tectonic, the period is shorter, the weather is shorter, and usually we are excited from the top. Okay? So it's, it's a gravity wave, but long period. So that's one approach about fluid dynamics, and you can do beautiful things here with this approach, sorry. Uh, let me add three slides now about some corollary about tsunami physics. First, don't call it a solito. In many fluid dynamics cases, usually tsunami is treated as a solito. Now, I'm not definitely, I'm not an expert, but solitons usually are coming from what, from some equations that are called KDD. It's related to the surname of two Dutch scientists. It's quite common in, in some mathematical physics courses. And KDD equations, Korte de Free, Dutch is very difficult. Please remember that to obtain a soliton, you need a dispersion. And we have it, because actually, if you give a look back to this, you will see that that's dispersion. Now, if you, sorry, maybe I'm going too fast here. Give a look to this. Uh, stop here, OK. Look, longer periods travel faster than shorter periods. That's dispersion. So. Most of the periods of the tsunamis are not dispersed, but this one, yes. Longer periods travel faster, so they arrive first. That's dispersion. Okay? Good. So the dispersion in KDV equations is there. This slide here, just to tell you in, in two words what is a solid. A tsunami is not a solid. That's a dispersion, and we have it. But in KDV, to have a solid tone, we need also nonlinearity. What is nonlinearity? Well, it's a term in which velocity depends on amplitude. You know that I hate nonlinearity. That's why in wave physics, in seismology, we have never been considering nonlinear terms. But you need to consider them when you want to study a wave that is breaking. Because only in that case, amplitude, so larger amplitudes, Let's imagine, let's take a beautiful wave. If you add nonlinear terms here, maybe larger amplitudes travel faster. And so we try to get before than these ones. So the beautiful profile of the wave that you can serve is like that one. But to add that one, you need nonlinear terms. OK? So only when the wave is approaching the shore and it's going to break, that part is nonlinear. Well, KDV equations, since they take both of them, actually, you have a beautiful reordering of a signal. What is the message here? Dispersion is creating disorder in the system. It's spreading the signal. Nonlinearity is destroying order because larger amplitudes will arrive first, so it's wave breaking. But if you put them together in a like a miracle, they reordering themselves, creating this profile here. It's called a solito. OK, tsunami is not a solito, because 95% of the life of a tsunami is a gravity wave in the linear domain. OK, just to add you some complete terms. Now some nice animations about the life of a tsunami that mostly is following this. It's a beautiful amplitude. Shallow water for a large part of its life. For some periods, it's filling the deep water part. That's why you have dispersion. You see longer periods travel faster, 0 0.2 kilometers per second. Shorter periods are a little bit slower, so they follow the train. Remember that the Two slides ago, we had a picture like that. Okay? And this is, if you want to, to see, that's frequency and that's period. So longer periods travel faster than shorter ones. That's why that part is arriving first. 
long periods, large wavelengths, okay? So dispersion is the most important effect for most of the life of the tsunami. And actually, the large part of the signal, that is this one, it's the long period, is not dispersed. It's the flat part of that curve, followed in coda by shorter periods. Good. Now, if most of the tsunami is following shallow water, square root of GH, what's going to happen when they approach now shoreline? H is getting thinner. So, on average, it's slowing. And if it is slowing, well, now the waves that are arriving in the back are, are going to bump on the other ones. What is the net result? It's called shoaling, but the net result is amplification. The wave train is getting slower, but larger. Until this part here, you see the profile here, it's still linear. And the next animation is uh, another view about this part of the life. But now, amplitude can get comparable with the thickness of the water height, okay, with the thickness of the water. Now, the tiny amplitude in open ocean, let's say two meters, now it's getting four, ten. And when you approach the shoreline, ten is ten. So the next and final part of the life of the tsunami is what is called bore forming. And now, amplitude is compared to, 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 to the water depth, so it's going to penetrate. That's the wave breaking. That's nonlinear terms. OK? OK, just some terminology. So from a fluid dynamics point of view, <coughs> you can treat it using the traditional dispersion relation of gravity waves, gravity waves, gravity waves. I want to tell it 10 times, OK? But long period, large wavelength. But the same physics, OK? So shoaling, large amplitudes, bore formation, penetration. Now you do understand that this is hazard assessment in some way. And hazard is conditioned by well, the morphology, bathymetry, local bathymetry around the coast, because maybe it's very steep, or maybe it's very regular. And this will decide how much the wave will penetrate. And so you can also think in terms of putting some barriers there. Now, that's risk reduction. And that will be the final part of today's talk. But before going towards that part, let me add one thing. Uh, I will skip some of the slides, is that there is another approach, because you have to know that the three dynamics approach has a problem. You can model beautiful local bathymetries here, very regular with bumps, whatever, but we have a problem, because it's a numerical approach that you can treat with finite elements. It's beautiful, very accurate. Now, this talks equation with nonlinear terms or whatever. The problem is to put the source. Because the source, maybe, is here. And we know by representation theorem how complicated the seismic source is. So that's why the numerical fluid dynamics approach is called uncoupled. Why? Because it's not able to take into account the source, so it's mapping the effect of the source on the kick on the bottom. So fluid dynamics is forgetting that these talks are not valid inside the Earth, the solid Earth. So they don't consider the source, but they map the source as an initial condition to the bottom. And we start from there. So they are representing the source as an initial condition. They cannot embed the source into the base talks. That's why it's called uncoupled. So the word is finishing here for fluid dynamics. That's rigid. Okay? As you know when you do modeling. OK. There is another approach. They, and it is called fully coupled approach. What is it? Well, it's what we considered in the other part of the course. 
So we can consider a set of solid layers, as we did, Rayleigh waves, lava waves, we know. We can put four kilometers of water on the top, well, we have Rayleigh waves, B waves, but if you do remember, usually we neglected gravity. Now, it's Friday and we're lazy, but if we are not that lazy, then we can insert G in those equations. It's a method of not being lazy. You have to know that inserting G in those equations, you get exactly this curve here as a new Rayleigh wave mode. Hmm. So let's imagine that you have Rayleigh waves here with your beautiful dispersion that is having wave physics. And if you switch on gravity in those equations, you find an additional curve. What is the point? is that if you put here frequency, what we studied was very high frequency. Now this is in the back, and it's much slower because this value is 0 0.2. But actually, if I would do that in scale, it will appear there. So what I'm telling you is that if you take the equations that we consider in wave physics, and you think that it is not Friday, but it's a Monday, you are fresh, you can add G there, do the algebra, write the dispersion equation for Rayleigh waves, and you find the tsunami mode. So the gravity branch of Rayleigh waves. Now you could say, oh my gosh, it's Friday. Why we have to do that? Well, you have a dispersion, a new dispersion curve, just one, but it's only one tsunami mode. And since it's Friday, you can use the same theory that we studied to describe the earthquake source to play that guitar. You have a new string. So we have a string of Rayleigh waves, and we know how to play them. Representation theory, do you remember? If a source is a point, it's a focal mechanism, do you remember? The same theory applies to this mode. Now, this system here is giving to you an additional branch in eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, and you can prove that it is exactly that branch. Stephen Ward was one of the first. We did the same, and you get it. You get exactly this curve here. Okay? Now, this approach here is fully coupled because you have the Earth, the solid Earth, you have the proper boundary conditions between the fluid and the solid. You have a free surface there. Okay, good. You find a, a new mode, and you can play it. Okay, eigenvalues, eigenfunctions are exactly the same. And now you can use all the theory that we developed during this course. Okay? And the end of the story is the following, is that you can write an equation of tsunami wave motion. I will not enter into this detail, that's why I'm going to skip these slides. Let me tell you that the results, so there is this additional approach, it's called fully coupled. Once you solve it, it's nice, there is one price to pay. It's very efficient, it's very nice, but you cannot treat complicated bathymetries. So there is every side as a positive, as a cons, pros, and cons. But just to tell you that if you want to consider tsunami gravity waves, you can also think in terms of the excitation of a new string played by the source. It's a long period, it's lower velocity. It's that curve. Okay? Okay, Stephen Ward used this approach and he did some beautiful and terrific animations. Now, I will leave them to you. I think, I hope, that the, let me check if the so you have just time to, to your, your final homework is to give a look to these animations. Let's see if it is still active. I hope so. No, it's not. Oh my gosh. Yes, it's there. Steven Ward, you can find a lot of animations about tsunamis here. Why I've left them there? Just to let you to remember that earthquakes, asteroids, volcanoes, 
submarine lens lights can generate tsunami. Everything that is giving a perturbation to, a, to water is a tsunami. But of course, mega earthquakes are totally different because they are long and large, so large wave. Okay? So your homework is to give a look to this beautiful animation and final message about tsunami physics before the final part is that some brave people, let me go to the picture here, okay, was also, I, I'm going fast because I, I will leave to you the animations to be, to be seen and also that part, okay, I want to be on time, I don't want to torture you. Uh, some slides that I was um, excluding there, the ones about tsunami hazard, I decided to, to skip them, and oh, no, well, they are coming later but probably I will skip. Just to tell you that if you want to apply the same... No, I can't run that pass. Okay, wait. Just news that I want you to remember if in your future you are going to continue this, your, your research about fully coupled systems. Some people is also not making the world to end at the water, but also to the atmosphere, where the perturbation of tsunami is causing perturbation in the atmosphere. Like gravity waves, tiny message. Then it's going also to the ionosphere, and that tiny message is creating strong electronic currents that satellites for GPS can detect. It's noise, but you can detect it. And that's why satellites are used also to track tsunamis in the ionosphere. My message for this slide here is that Nature, the Earth, as a model, is not made by oceanography, seismology, atmosphere physics, actually it could be fully coupled. So a perturbation in some place can transmit a message in totally different places. Okay? That's the message. Uh, you have some links and slides about that. To go towards the end, well, that's quite trivial to, to be understood, and you have also seen the we can use tsunami physics also to go towards hazard. That's the final part of the talk today. After yesterday's seminar, you know what is uh, hazard and risk. You understand how physics modeling can be used to produce a forecast model. Could be very useful to, for example, to prepare an equation. You have seen that tsunami modeling is not that difficult. Okay. It's difficult if you want to take care about tiny details. But, on average, you can estimate with a relatively good approximation the possible arrival time and maximum height of a tsunami wave field. Uh, you do understand that traditionally the seismic input for hazard can be very complicated, as you have seen yesterday, because duration of a signal that is shaking a building the frequency content can be very important. But what is important for tsunami actually is the maximum height. So hazard parameters for tsunami hazard can be a little bit simpler. And you can predict these ones, creating scenarios. Then with modeling, what you can do later, at a later stage, if you have also, for example, a model of a harbor or of a city, in front of the sea. You can also model with fluid dynamics now, not with seismology, how water is penetrating inside the system. Uh, for example, you that are coming from the um, PhD at the Unity has, one of the teachers there is Vincenzo Armenio. Mm -hmm. Okay, for example, with these models, you can try to model these kind of things. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of modeling now this Stokes equation and not the equation of the last equation, as you can guess. So you can use your, your other courses, okay? And what you can do then, you can create an inundation maps. They can be used to forecast future scenarios or, as you have seen in the case of Toku, NOAA is producing these possible inundation maps while a warning is on, is on. So they can, in some hours, develop a possible inundation scenario and say, okay, please evacuate. Okay, don't have a quick. It's not easy, you, you can understand, but you can produce this in advance. 
So that's dealing with tsunami hazard. Another message that I wanted to give to you with, with these two slides, and these are coming from the PDF paper that was that is on the website but is not working, is that Stephen Ward produced a sort of a shortcut of tsunami hazard assessment in five minutes. Now, for example, you do remember the lecture that we took for two days ago for seismic hazard. You define the sources. Let's forget it now for the um, rate. And then you predict the ground motion given magnitude and distance. Attenuation low GMP, yes, it's been, been mentioned many times. OK, can we do that for tsunami? Yes. For very simple models, here we have distance, very different scale here. We can go up to 10,000 kilometers. Gravity waves are very efficient. Magnitude, so it's an attenuation low. You can create bands here of maximum height. Instead of using PGA, you can use this. With simple modeling, you can produce these ones. These are bands. OK, step number one. You can predict a night, roughly, given a magnitude and a distance. What you can do next is to predict the shoaling effect at the seashore, so the amplification, the side effects, if you want, in knowing the depth at the source and the depth of the water at the shore. And you can amplify your height due to the shoaling effect. It's called Green's Law. Then you can decide a threshold over which the height that you are predicting is overcritical. And define all the sources that can affect a site. So we're sitting in Venice. We can compute all the possible heights that are coming from the earthquakes around the Adriatic Sea that luckily are not that large in terms of magnitude. Decide the critical height, you can imagine that the Japanese coast is a little bit different than, the, than Venice. Magnitude in the Adriatic Basin, for example, is, cannot be 9, cannot be 8, maybe can be 7. And so with tsunami height, if you take 7, a tiny distance here, you see that could be 10 centimeters. Okay? Now, please do remember that 10 centimeters is nothing if you have a wave of one meter. If you have a wave of 100 meters, well, that's not nothing. You could say, well, okay, come on, maybe it's 10 centimeters. You can imagine if you have a seed that is exposed, like Venice, or some, like in some beaches uh, in central Italy, the hazard is not zero, because water can penetrate. Maybe it's not going to kill, but it's going to cause a lot of damage. Can imagine this. Okay, so you decide the critical height, then you consider all the possible sources that are contributing to that height, and you can compute what they call probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment. Now, if you give a look to this, it's exactly the Poisson uh, expression that you have used also in your homework. The only difference here is okay, instead of having ground motion prediction equation, we can have tsunami motion prediction equations. Instead of having PGA, we can use maximum height. Okay? That's the philosophy. So as well as we discuss about seismic hazard assessment, we can discuss about tsunami hazard assessment. Okay, let's go towards the final slides of this course. And I want to show to you how the Japanese community, before Toku, was supposed to have totally relieved, well, pretty much totally relieved the tsunami risk, not the hazard, but risk. Because in most part of the coast in Japan, there were tsunami protections. So you can predict in some places a tsunami height of five meters. Let's build a wall. Okay? Let's build a sea gate. Some of them are impressive. Oh, well, that's a protection. You're not, after you have made a tsunami hazard, you can decide to kill vulnerability. So with this, you're totally not vulnerable. 
right? Where is the gate? Some of them are very impressive with seawalls, barriers here, you see? So you're safe. Well, no. Because you can imagine that you have put to zero vulnerability, but maybe the decision is also depend, depending on your hazard assessment. In many places, the tsunami hazard was as, as being assessed by five meters. Now, wait a second, five meters is huge. Can you imagine five meters? It's not like that, okay? It's a huge wall, two kilometers long. So these, these barriers were impressive. But you can also imagine that if what is coming is not five, it is, let's say, seven, eight, now we have no protection. Okay, and that was the impressive story of two villages on the Japanese coast. Uh, and the, the course is going to, to close with these slides, actually, with these five final slides, just to tell you that things in terms of physics, uh, this course is called theoretical seismology, and actually we devoted most of it to, to some uh, elasticity, source theory, blah, 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 but also to hazard, seismic hazard, tsunami hazard, and the concept of hazard and risk. Now, how to treat the risk? After Paolo Bazzurro yesterday's talk, you have seen there are many strategies. But you have to, to know that actually Fudai village decided to take another strategy. Because the major at that time said, hmm, the elders remember that after the Meiji earthquake, in some places, tsunami height was reported to be 10 meters. So maybe the code was saying, put six, he decided to build a taller wall. Now you can imagine how difficult is this decision because it, you're, you're, you're going to spend a lot of more money. But he decided to act in that way in 1984. Well, okay, you have to know that this Seagate protected that village because it was taller than the prediction of the code. And if you compare Miyako and Fudai, and you see the two places here, one was safe and the other was not. So the hazard, in some way, with the same estimation, hmm, not exactly the same, because in Fudai, the major decided to remember these old stones. And those stones had been deployed after the Meiji earthquake, saying, I'm not able to read Japanese, but OK, saying, do not build houses after this, because something happened in the past. Okay, so it was written. There. So he decided to use this as a hazard estimation. But if you want, he is a tsunami warning system for a long time. So that's why he decided to, to build a, a taller wall. Uh, while in Miyako, they decided to accept the, the six meters. Now, six meters, again, it seems to be a very important killing vulnerability decision. What is the point? Well, you know the point. Uh, let me go to this. It's a picture prepared by Seth Stein and Oka. That's the point. That's the summary of the course. Because if you remember what we discussed when we defined moment, it was one of the first quantities that I was drawing. Okay? U, A. Okay. Seismic moment. You do remember Newton times meter. Okay, it's related to magnitude, but it's related to area. Good. Now, they were waiting for magnitude 8. It's huge. And you have a 5 meter slip. And there's a rule of thumb with showing blah, blah. You are getting a 10 meters tsunami wave. But if you get a magnitude 9, as it was, now you have a 10 meter slip, well, some copper's meet the theory that we discussed, and now you have 20 meters there. So if you want tsunami physics or source physics, it could be very simple, is what they were waiting for. Let me show to you these two maps that are impressive. 
because only the Japanese community was able to produce this kind of maps. Let's give a look to that. It's a sort of a hazard assessment. Now, this map here is produced, I think, every year. This is January 1, 2008. And it's estimated maybe a long-term possibility within 30 years. We are using 30 years, not 50. OK. And all these patches here are segments of a subduction. Each of them is associated with a possible earthquake with a given magnitude, with some probability to occur in 30 years. So they, they study the sleep rate of the past. I don't know what, how we are doing this. Look, some of them were definitely waiting for. 99%, that means, OK, we are waiting for that. Then there is this 90%. Yes, it's going to come. There was also this one, 87%. So they were ready with tsunami warning, with earthquake warning, with whatever. But they were not waiting for a magnitude 9, taking all of them. And actually, that map has been released also on January 1, 2011. So some numbers change here, but they were definitely waiting for this. But they were not waiting for this. So you do understand that actually the most difficult part may be of hazard assessment for seismic and tsunami is to assess the maximum capable earthquake in some cases. So we were ready. Good hazard, very low vulnerability. What can you do better than that? Nothing. But actually something was wrong. Because what occurred was a magnitude 9. Uh, let me show to you also some examples of computation. Because actually, my final message is, OK, you can do the best work in hazard that you can imagine, and they did. They were the only country taking into account tsunami hazard assessment in such a way. They started the project a long time before, since 1999, definitely before the Sumatra event. It was the only country in the world. And you see now some words that you have also heard yesterday, deterministic. Actually, it was physics-based. Give a look to the computation that they did. Here, look. Um, they participated also to some workshops in, in ICTP in 2009, 2010, after the Sumatra event, showing the results. They were impressive. Look. All these faults here have been considered in tsunami modeling much before that some important earthquake occurred. Okay? They changed the strike, the deep, the rake, all the parameters that we can imagine. And they were simulating events, estimating the maximum height. What can you do better than this? Well, the final assessment is that, for example, at Fukushima, there was a tsunami wall of if I remember correctly, it was about seven meters, seven meters. OK. And their estimation about the possible maximum height there was this, 5.7. 5.7 is less than 7. Good. You're done. OK. The first. And they published these results a long time ago. And these slides here are coming from a meeting that was occurring in Igata in November 2010. So before talk. You could say, well, come on, let's maybe deterministic, let's be maximum, let's do something probabilistic. They did. It's called logic tree. And now you do understand this curve. It's the same curve that you studied, I hope, for your, for your homework with an annual probability of exceedance, but not in PGA of tsunami height. OK, the Japanese law is saying, let's stay for ordinary buildings for 100 years. OK, now if you take 400 years, you read this, you go here, and OK, it's less than 7. Good. We're done. 
Well, actually, what is the maximum tsunami height recorded at Fukushima? It was 15 meters. Well, it is here, maybe. But you have to go to probabilities that are very, very low. Now, you can understand also how tricky it could be probabilistic. Because you have to decide, OK, now what? Which threshold? Well, nature does not know about this. So 15 meters occurred there. So the final message is, also closing this, this course here, uh, I was also adding this slide here. I think the last slide that you have there is, I don't remember which one. You have also the table with, uh, what is your final slide on the notes? Oh, that one? Yeah. Oh, OK, sorry. So I had it, it should be this one, right? So this is, these are just, now I've, I've been revealing them, but just to, to close. Since yesterday you had been, uh, very been attending a seminar about hazard, risk, whatever, now you see how it can be applied also to, to tsunamis. Deterministic, or nowadays it's called physics-based. Look, it's beautiful. What is missing there? A fault with magnitude 9. With magnitude 9, you can easily model 20 meters, 80 meters, 15 meters. You could say, but no one was waiting for magnitude 9. Well, we don't know. Maybe they did some computation, but maybe the owners of Fukushima at that time, but was going to be closed in two years, they said, okay, no, let's put, let's take this, okay? These are beautiful. Um, who knows? Or maybe they, we, had been simply wrong, not inserting the proper scenario there. Uh, in Italy, what is, could happen, maybe not to consider a magnitude 6 to 9, but maybe many faults are hidden somewhere. OK? So maybe in hazard assessment, so you can do the best physics that you want, but maybe in hazard and risk, hazard assessment and risk reduction, Maybe the most difficult part is to identify the sources and characterize them with a the proper magnitude. But still an open question. Um, OK, so that's the end of the course. We'll be running starting from Toku, event to show how different the signals could be to long period, to short period, acceleration, near field, near source, Green's function, Near field, far field, representation theorem, far source, near source. Then we went to the point source, focal mechanisms. Then we studied the source spectrum, omega square. Then we used that also to assess the model magnitude using moment going through Richter's magnitude and MS and MB. Then we considered an elasticity. Then we applied this to seismic hazard, and then today we briefly discuss a part of tsunami physics, and we have dealt with tsunami hazard. On some side, it's simpler, because maybe you need just maximum height and arrival time. On another way, it's maybe a little bit more complicated, because it may contain nonlinear terms, but sometimes uh, can be included in the fluid dynamics approach, but it's not easy to embed the physics of the source. OK, so that's the summary. You have all the material. I hope I will send an email to Patricia now to make the website to wake up. I hope it's going on. I'm going to ask you during the oral just what we discussed together. OK? Again, I don't care too much about algebra. But I care a lot about the logic of the different steps. So what is a point source or what is a, an extended source? what the representation means, and so on. What is Q? OK? So we will meet on 5 March, around half past 9. And, uh, the time of the order could be 5 minutes or half an hour. It depends by you. OK? OK, good work, and enjoy also the other lectures. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a lecture here today? No. no.
So I'm going to send an, an email to Patricia saying that, that 